Chapter 41 The Great Explosion and the Rush Down Below The next day, Thursday, August 27th, is a well-remembered date in our subterranean journey. It never returns to my memory without sending through me a shudder of horror and a palpitation of the heart. From that hour we had no further occasion for the exercise of reason, or judgment, or skill, or contrivance. We were henceforth to be hurled along the playthings of the fierce elements of the deep. At six we were afoot, the moment drew near to clear away by blasting through the opposing mass of granite. I begged for the honour of lighting the fuse. This duty done, I was to join my companions on the raft, which had not yet been unloaded. We should then push off as far as we could and avoid the dangers arising from the explosion, the effects of which were not likely to be confined to the rock itself. The fuse was calculated to burn ten minutes before setting fire to the mine. I therefore had sufficient time to get away to the raft. I prepared to fulfil my task with some anxiety. After a hasty meal, my uncle and the hunter embarked whilst I remained on the shore. I was supplied with a lighted lantern to set fire to the fuse. Now go, said my uncle, and return immediately to us. Don't be uneasy, I replied. I will not play, by the way. I immediately proceeded to the mouth of the tunnel. I opened my lantern. I laid hold of the end of the match. The professor stood, chronometer in hand. Ready? he cried. I Fire! I instantly plunged the end of the fuse into the lantern. It spluttered and flamed, and I ran at the top of my speed to the raft. Come on board quickly, and let us push off. Hands with a vigorous thrust sent us from the shore. The raft shot twenty fathoms out to sea. It was a moment of intense excitement. The professor was watching the hand of the chronometer. Five minutes more, he said. Four. Three. My pulse beat half seconds. Two. One. Down! Granite rocks! Down with you! What took place at that moment? I believe I did not hear the dull roar of the explosion, but the rocks suddenly assumed a new arrangement. They rent asunder like a curtain. I saw a bottomless pit open on the shore. The sea, lashed into sudden fury, rose up in an enormous billow, on the ridge of which the unhappy raft was uplifted bodily in the air with all its crew and cargo. We all three fell down flat. In less than a second we were in a deep, unfathomable darkness. Then I felt as if not only myself, but the raft also had no support beneath. I thought it was sinking, but it was not so. I wanted to speak to my uncle, but the roaring of the waves prevented him from hearing even the sound of my voice. In spite of darkness, noise, astonishment and terror, I then understood what had taken place. On the other side of the blown-up rock was an abyss. The explosion had caused a kind of earthquake in this fissured and abysmal region. A great gulf had opened, and the sea, now changed into a torrent, was hurrying us along into it. I gave myself up for lost. An hour passed away. Two hours, perhaps. I cannot tell. We clutched each other fast to save ourselves from being thrown off the raft. We felt violent shocks whenever we were borne heavily against the craggy projections. Yet these shocks were not very frequent, from which I concluded that the gully was widening. It was no doubt the same road that Saknosem had taken, but instead of walking peaceably down it as he had done, we were carrying a whole sea along with us. These ideas, it will be understood, presented themselves to my mind in a vague and undetermined form. I had difficulty in associating any ideas together during this headlong race, which seemed like a vertical descent. To judge by the air which was whistling past me and made a whizzing in my ears, we were moving faster than the fastest express trains. To light a torch under these conditions would have been impossible, and our last electric apparatus had been shattered by the force of the explosion. I was therefore much surprised to see a clear light shining near me. It lighted up the calm and unmoved countenance of Hans. The skilful huntsman had succeeded in lighting the lantern, and although it flickered so much as to threaten to go out, it threw a fitful light across the awful darkness. I was right in my supposition. It was a wide gallery. The dim light could not show us both of its walls at once. The fall of the waters which were carrying us away exceeded that of the swiftest rapids in American rivers. Its surface seemed composed of a sheaf of arrows hurled with inconceivable force. I cannot convey my impressions by a better comparison. The raft, occasionally seized by an eddy, spun around as it still flew along. When it approached the walls of the gallery, I threw on them the light of the lantern, and I could judge somewhat of the velocity of our speed by noticing how the jagged projections of the rock spun into endless ribbons and bands, so that we seemed confined within a network of shifting lines. I supposed we were running at the rate of thirty leagues an hour. My uncle and I gazed on each other with haggard eyes, clinging to the stump of the mast which had snapped asunder at the first shock of our great catastrophe. We kept our backs to the wind, not to be stifled by the rapidity of a movement which no human power could check. Hours passed away, no change in our situation, 
but a discovery came to complicate matters and make them worse. In seeking to put our cargo into somewhat better order, I found that the greater part of the articles embarked had disappeared at the moment of the explosion, when the sea broke in upon us with such violence. I wanted to know exactly what we had saved, and with the lantern in my hand I began my examination. Of our instruments, none were saved but the compass and the chronometer. Our stock of ropes and ladders was reduced to a bit of cord rolled around the stump of the mast. Not a spade, not a pickaxe, not a hammer was left us, and irreparable disaster, we had only one day's provisions left. I searched every nook and corner, every crack and cranny in the raft. There was nothing. Our provisions were reduced to one bit of salt meat and a few biscuits. I stared at our failing supplies stupidly. I refused to take in the gravity of our loss. And yet what was the use of troubling myself? If we had had provisions enough for months, how could we get out of the abyss into which we were being hurled by an irresistible torrent? Why should we fear the horrors of famine when death was swooping down upon us in a multitude of other forms? Would there be time left to die of starvation? Yet, by an inexplicable play of the imagination, I forgot my present dangers to contemplate the threatening future. Was there any chance of escaping from the fury of this impetuous torrent and of returning to the surface of the globe? I could not form the slightest conjecture how or when, but one chance in a thousand, or ten thousand, is still a chance, whilst death from starvation would leave us not the smallest hope in the world. The thought came into my mind to declare the whole truth to my uncle, to show him the dreadful straits to which we were reduced, and to calculate how long we might yet expect to live. But I had the courage to preserve silence. I wished to leave him cool and self-possessed. At that moment, the light from our lantern began to sink by little and little, and then went out entirely. The wick had burnt itself out. Black night reigned again, and there was no hope left of being able to dissipate the palpable darkness. We had yet a torch left, but we could not have kept it alight. Then, like a child, I closed my eyes firmly, not to see the darkness. After a considerable lapse of time, our speed redoubled. I could perceive it by the sharpness of the currents that blew past my face. The descent became steeper. I believe we were no longer sliding, but falling down. I had an impression that we were dropping vertically. My uncle's hand and the vigorous arms of hands held me fast. Suddenly, after a space of time that I could not measure, I felt a shock. The raft had not struck against any hard resistance, but had suddenly been checked in its fall. A water spout, an immense liquid column, was beating upon the surface of the waters. I was suffocating. I was drowning. But this sudden flood was not of long duration. In a few seconds I found myself in the air again, which I inhaled with all the force of my lungs. My uncle and hands were still holding me fast by the arms, and the raft was still carrying us. Chapter 42 Headlong Speed Upward Through the Horrors of Darkness It might have been, as I guessed, about ten at night. The first of my senses which came into play after this last bout was that of hearing. All at once I could hear, and it was a real exercise of the sense of hearing. I could hear the silence in the gallery after the din which for hours had stunned me. At last these words of my uncle's came to me like a vague murmuring. We are going up. What do you mean? I cried. Yes, we are going up. Up! I stretched out my arm, I touched the wall, and drew back my hand, bleeding. We were ascending with extreme rapidity. The torch! The torch! cried the professor. Not without difficulty, Hans succeeded in lighting the torch, and the flame, preserving its upward tendency, threw enough light to show us what kind of a place we were in. Just as I thought, said the professor. We are in a tunnel not four and twenty feet in diameter. The water had reached the bottom of the gulf. It is now rising to its level, and carrying us with it. Where to? I cannot tell, but we must be ready for anything. We are mounting at a speed which seems to me of fourteen feet in a second, or ten miles an hour. At this rate, we shall get on. Yes, if nothing stops us, if this well has an aperture, but suppose it to be stopped. If the air is condensed by the pressure of this column of water, we shall be crushed. Axel, replied the professor with perfect coolness, our situation is almost desperate but there are some chances of deliverance, and it is these that I am considering. If at every instant we may perish, so at every instant we may be saved. Let us then be prepared to seize upon the smallest advantage. But what shall we do now? Recruit our strength by eating. At these words I fixed a haggard eye upon my uncle. That which I had been so unwilling to confess at last had to be told. Eat, did you say? Yes, at once. The professor added a few words in Danish, but Hans shook his head mournfully. What? cried my uncle. Have we lost our provisions? Yes, here is all we have left, one bit of salt meat for the three. My uncle stared at me as if he could not understand. 
Well, said I, do you think we have any chance of being saved? My question was unanswered. An hour passed away. I began to feel the pangs of a violent hunger. My companions were suffering too, and not one of us dared touch this wretched remnant of our goodly store. But now we were mounting up with excessive speed. Sometimes the air would cut our breath short, as is experienced by aeronauts ascending too rapidly. But whilst they suffer from cold in proportion to their rise, we were beginning to feel a contrary effect. The heat was increasing in a manner to cause us the most fearful anxiety, and certainly the temperature was at this moment at the height of a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. What could be the meaning of such a change? Up to this time, facts had supported the theories of Davy and of Liedenbrock. Until now, particular conditions of non-conducting rocks, electricity and magnetism had tempered the laws of nature, giving us only a moderately warm climate for the theory of a central fire remained, in my estimation, the only one that was true and explicable. Were we then turning back to where the phenomena of central heat ruled in all their rigour and would reduce the most refractory rocks to the state of a molten liquid? I feared this, and said to the professor, If we are neither drowned, nor shattered to pieces, nor starved to death, there is still the chance that we may be burned alive and reduced to ashes. At this he shrugged his shoulders and returned to his thoughts. Another hour passed, and except some slight increase in the temperature, nothing new had happened. Come, said he, we must determine upon something. Determine on what, said I. Yes, we must recruit our strength by carefully rationing ourselves, and so prolong our existence by a few hours, but we shall be reduced to a very great weakness at last, and our last hour is not far off. Well, if there is any chance of safety, if a moment for active exertion presents itself, where should we find the required strength if we allowed ourselves to be enfeebled by hunger? Well, uncle, when this bit of meat has been devoured, what shall we have left? Nothing, Axel, nothing at all. But will it do you any more good to devour it with your eyes than with your teeth? Your reasoning has in it neither sense nor energy. Then don't you despair? I cried irritably. No, certainly not, was the professor's firm reply. What, do you think there is any chance of safety left? Yes, I do. As long as the heart beats, as long as body and soul keep together, I cannot admit that any creature endowed with a will has need to despair of life. Resolute words, these. The man who could speak so, under such circumstances, was of no ordinary type. Finally, what do you mean to do? I asked. Eat what is left to the last crumb, and recruit our fading strength. This meal will be our last, perhaps, so let it be. But at any rate, we shall once more be men, and not exhausted empty bags. Well, let us consume it, then, I cried. My uncle took the piece of meat and the few biscuits which had escaped from the general destruction. He divided them into three equal portions and gave one to each. This made about a pound of nourishment for each. The professor ate his greedily, with a kind of feverish rage. I ate without pleasure, almost with disgust. Hands quietly, moderately masticating his small mouthfuls without any noise, and relishing them with the calmness of a man above all anxiety about the future. By diligent search, he had found a flask of Hollands. He offered it to us each in turn, and this generous beverage cheered us up slightly. Futreflig, said Hans, drinking in his turn. Excellent, replied my uncle. A glimpse of hope had returned, although without cause, but our last meal was over, and it was now five in the morning. Man is so constituted that health is a purely negative state. Hunger, once satisfied, it is difficult for a man to imagine the horrors of starvation, they cannot be understood without being felt. Therefore, it was that after our long fast, these few mouthfuls of meat and biscuit made us triumph over our past agonies. But as soon as the meal was done, we each of us fell deep into thought. What was Hans thinking of, that man of the far west, but who seemed ruled by the fatalist doctrines of the east? As for me, my thoughts were made up of remembrances, and they carried me up to the surface of the globe of which I ought never to have taken leave. The house in the Königstrasse, my poor dear Grauben, that kind soul Martha, flitted like visions before my eyes, and in the dismal moanings which from time to time reached my ears, I thought I could distinguish the roar of the traffic of the great cities upon earth. My uncle still had his eye upon his work. Torch in hand, he tried to gather some idea of our situation from the observation of the strata. This calculation could, at best, be but a vague approximation, but a learned man is always a philosopher when he succeeds in remaining cool, and assuredly Professor Liedenbrock possessed this quality to a surprising degree. I could hear him murmuring geological terms. I could understand them, and in spite of myself, I felt interested in this last geological study. Eruptive granite, he was saying. 
We are still in the primitive period, but we are going up, up, higher still. Who can tell? Ah, who can tell? With his hand he was examining the perpendicular wall, and in a few more minutes he continued. This is nice. Here is mica schist. Ah, presently we shall come to the transition period. And then? What did the professor mean? Could he be trying to measure the thickness of the crust of the earth that lay between us and the world above? Had he any means of making this calculation? No, he had not the aneroid, and no guessing could supply its place. Still, the temperature kept rising, and I felt myself steeped in a broiling atmosphere. I could only compare it to the heat of a furnace at the moment when the molten metal is running into the mould. Gradually, we had been obliged to throw aside our coats and waistcoats. The lightest covering became uncomfortable, and even painful. Are we rising into a fiery furnace? I cried at one moment when the heat was redoubling. No, replied my uncle. That is impossible, quite impossible. Yet, I answered, feeling the wall, this well is burning hot. At the same moment, touching the water, I had to withdraw my hand in haste. The water is scalding, I cried. This time, the professor's only answer was an angry gesture. Then an unconquerable terror seized upon me, from which I could no longer get free. I felt that a catastrophe was approaching before which the boldest spirit must quail. A dim, vague notion laid hold of my mind, but which was fast hardening into certainty. I tried to repel it, but it would return. I dared not express it in plain terms. Yet a few involuntary observations confirmed me in my view. By the flickering light of the torch, I could distinguish contortions in the granite beds. A phenomenon was unfolding in which electricity would play the principal part. Then, this unbearable heat, this boiling water, I consulted the compass. The compass had lost its properties. It had ceased to act properly. Chapter 43 Shot Out of a Volcano at Last Yes, our compass was no longer a guide. The needle flew from pole to pole with a kind of frenzied impulse. It ran round the dial and spun hither and thither as if it were giddy or intoxicated. I knew quite well that according to the best received theories, the mineral covering of the globe is never at absolute rest. The changes brought about by the chemical decomposition of its component parts, the agitation caused by great liquid torrents and the magnetic currents are continually tending to disturb it, even when living beings upon its surface may fancy that all is quiet below. A phenomenon of this kind would not have greatly alarmed me, or at any rate it would not have given rise to dreadful apprehensions. But other facts, other circumstances of a peculiar nature, came to reveal to me by degrees the true state of the case. There came incessant and continuous explosions. I could only compare them to the loud rattle of a long train of chariots driven at full speed over the stones, or a roar of unintermitting thunder. Then the disordered compass, thrown out of gear by the electric currents, confirmed me in a growing conviction. The mineral crust of the globe threatened to burst up, the granite foundations to come together with a crash, the fissure through which we were helplessly being driven would be filled up, the void would be full of crushed fragments of rock, and we poor wretched mortals were to be buried and annihilated in this dreadful consummation. My uncle, I cried, we are lost now, utterly lost. What are you in a fright about now? was the calm rejoinder. What is the matter with you? The matter? Look at those quaking walls, look at those shivering rocks. Don't you feel the burning heat? Don't you see how the water boils and bubbles? Are you blind to the dense vapours and steam growing thicker and denser every minute? See this agitated compass needle. It is an earthquake that is threatening us. My undaunted uncle calmly shook his head. Do you think, said he, an earthquake is coming? I do. Well, I think you are mistaken. What, don't you recognise the symptoms? Of an earthquake? No, I am looking out for something better. What can you mean? Explain. It is an eruption, Axel. An eruption? Do you mean to affirm that we are running up the shaft of a volcano? I believe we are, said the indomitable professor with an air of perfect self-possession. And it is the best thing that could possibly happen to us under our circumstances. Best thing? Was my uncle stark mad? What did the man mean? And what was the use of saying facetious things at a time like this? What? I shouted. Are we being taken up in an eruption? Our fate has flung us here among burning lavas, molten rocks, boiling waters, and all kinds of volcanic matter. We're going to be pitched out, expelled, tossed up, vomited, spit out high into the air, along with fragments of rock, showers of ashes and scoria, in the midst of a towering rush of smoke and flames, and it is the best thing that could happen to us. Yes, replied the professor, eyeing me over his spectacles. I don't see any other way of reaching the surface of the earth. 
I pass rapidly over the thousand ideas which pass through my mind. My uncle was right, undoubtedly right, and never had he seemed to be more daring and more confirmed in his notions than at this moment when he was calmly contemplating the chances of being shot out of a volcano. In the meantime, up we went. The night passed away in continual ascent. The din and uproar around us became more and more intensified. I was stifled and stunned. I thought my last hour was approaching, and yet imagination is such a strong thing that even in the supreme hour I was occupied with strange and almost childish speculations. But I was the victim, not the master of my own thoughts. It was very evident that we were being hurried upward upon the crest of a wave of eruption. Beneath our raft were boiling waters, and under these the more sluggish lather was working its way up in a heated mass, together with shoals of fragments of rock which, when they arrived at the crater, would be dispersed in all directions high and low. We were imprisoned in the shaft or chimney of some volcano. There was no room to doubt that. But this time, instead of Snaefell, an extinct volcano, we were inside one in full activity. I wondered, therefore, where could this mountain be, and in what part of the world we were to be shot out? I made no doubt but that it would be in some northern region. Before its disorders set in, the needle had never deviated from that direction. From Cape Saknesem we had been carried due north for hundreds of leagues. Were we under Iceland again? Were we destined to be thrown up out of Hecla, or by which of seven other fiery craters in that island? Within a radius of 500 leagues to the west, I remembered under this parallel of latitude only the imperfectly known volcanoes of the northeast coast of America. To the east there was only one in the 80th degree of north latitude, the Esk in the Anmayan Islands, not far from Spitsbergen. Certainly there was no lack of craters, and there were some capacious enough to throw out a whole army, but I wanted to know which of them was to serve us for an exit from the inner world. Towards morning, the ascending movement became accelerated. If the heat increased, instead of diminishing as we approached nearer to the surface of the globe, this effect was due to local causes alone, and those volcanic. The manner of our locomotion left no doubt in my mind. An enormous force, a force of hundreds of atmospheres generated by the extreme pressure of confined vapours, was driving us irresistibly forward, but to what numberless dangers it exposed us. Soon lurid lights began to penetrate the vertical gallery which widened as we went up. Right and left I could see deep channels, like huge tunnels, out of which escaped dense volumes of smoke. Tongues of fire lapped the walls, which crackled and sputtered under the intense heat. See? See, my uncle? I cried. Well, those are only sulphurous flames and vapours, which one must expect to see in an eruption. They are quite natural. But suppose they should wrap us round. But they won't wrap us round. But we shall be stifled. We shall not be stifled at all. The gallery is widening, and if it becomes necessary, we shall abandon the raft and creep into a crevice. But the water, the rising water. There is no more water, Axel, only a lava paste which is bearing us up on its surface to the top of the crater. The liquid column had indeed disappeared, to give place to a dense and still boiling eruptive matter of all kinds. The temperature was becoming unbearable. A thermometer exposed to this atmosphere would have marked 150 degrees. The perspiration streamed from my body, but for the rapidity of our ascent we should have been suffocated. But the professor gave up his idea of abandoning the raft, and it was well he did. However roughly joined together, those planks afforded us a firmer support than we could have found anywhere else. About eight in the morning a new incident occurred. The upward movement ceased, the raft lay motionless. What is this? I asked, shaken by this sudden stoppage as if by a shock. It is a halt, replied my uncle. Is the eruption checked? I asked. I hope not. I rose and tried to look around me. Perhaps the raft itself, stopped in its course by a projection, was staying the volcanic torrent. If this were the case, we should have to release it as soon as possible. But it was not so. The blast of ashes, scorix and rubbish had ceased to rise. Has the eruption stopped? I cried. Ah, said my uncle between his clenched teeth. You are afraid. But don't alarm yourself. This lull cannot last long. It has lasted now five minutes, and in a short time we shall resume our journey to the mouth of the crater. As he spoke, the professor continued to consult his chronometer, and he was again right in his prognostications. The raft was soon hurried and driven forward with a rapid but irregular movement, which lasted about ten minutes, and then stopped again. Very good, said my uncle. In ten minutes more we shall be off again, for our present business lies with an intermittent volcano. It gives us time now and then to take a breath. This was perfectly true. When the ten minutes were over, we started off again with renewed and increased speed. We were obliged to lay fast hold of the planks of the raft not to be thrown off. Then again, the paroxysm was over. I have since reflected upon this singular phenomenon without being able to explain it. 
At any rate, it was clear that we were not in the main shaft of the volcano, but in a lateral gallery where there were felt recurrent tunes of reaction. How often this operation was repeated, I cannot say. All I know is that at each fresh impulse we were hurled forward with a greatly increased force, and we seemed as if we were mere projectiles. During the short halts we were stifled with the heat. Whilst we were being projected forward, the hot air almost stopped my breath. I thought for a moment how delightful it would be to find myself carried suddenly into the Arctic regions, with a cold 30 degrees below the freezing point. My overheated brain conjured up visions of white plains of cool snow where I might roll and allay my feverish heat. Little by little, my brain, weakened by so many constantly repeated shocks, seemed to be giving way altogether. But for the strong arm of hands, I should more than once have had my head broken against the granite roof of our burning dungeon. I have therefore no exact recollection of what took place during the following hours. I have a confused impression left of continuous explosions, loud detonations, a general shaking of the rocks all around us, and of a spinning movement with which our raft was once whirled helplessly round. It rocked upon the lava torrent amidst a dense fall of ashes. Snorting flames darted their fiery tongues at us. There were wild, fierce puffs of stormy wind from below, resembling the blasts of vast iron furnaces blowing all at one time and I caught a glimpse of the figure of hands lighted up by the fire, and all the feeling I had left was just what I imagined must be the feeling of an unhappy criminal doomed to be blown away alive from the mouth of a cannon, just before the trigger is pulled, and the flying limbs and rags of flesh and skin fill the quivering air and splatter the blood-stained ground. Chapter 44 Sunny Lands in the Blue Mediterranean when I opened my eyes again, I felt myself grasped by the belt with the strong hand of our guide. With the other arm, he supported my uncle. I was not seriously hurt, but I was shaken and bruised and battered all over. I found myself lying on the sloping side of a mountain, only two yards from a gaping gulf, which would have swallowed me up had I leaned at all that way. Hands had saved me from death whilst I lay rolling on the edge of the crater. "'Where are we?' asked my uncle, irascibly, as if he felt much injured by being landed upon the earth again. The hunter shook his head in a token of complete ignorance. "'Is it Iceland?' I asked. "Nitch," replied Hans. "'What? Not Iceland?' cried the professor. "'Hans must be mistaken,' I said, raising myself up. This was our final surprise after all the astonishing events of our wonderful journey. I expected to see a white cone covered with the eternal snow of ages rising from the midst of the barren deserts of the icy north, faintly lighted with the pale rays of the Arctic sun, far away in the highest latitudes known. But contrary to all our expectations, my uncle, the Icelander, and myself were sitting halfway down a mountain baked under the burning rays of a southern sun, which was blistering us with the heat, and blinding us with the fierce light of its nearly vertical rays. I could not believe my own eyes, but the heated air and the sensation of burning left me no room for doubt. We had come out of the crater half-naked, and the radiant orb to which we had been strangers for two months was lavishing upon us out of his blazing splendours more of his light and heat than we were able to receive with comfort. When my eyes had become accustomed to the bright light to which they had been so long strangers, I began to use them to set my imagination right. At least I would have it to be Spitzbergen, and I was in no humour to give up this notion. The professor was the first to speak, and said, Well, this is not much like Iceland. But is it Jan Mayen? I asked. Nor that either, he answered. There is no northern mountain. Here are no granite peaks capped with snow. Look, Axel, look. Above our heads, at a height of five hundred feet or more, we saw the crater of a volcano, through which, at intervals of fifteen minutes or so, there issued with loud explosions lofty columns of fire, mingled with pumice stones, ashes, and flowing lava. I could feel the heaving of the mountain, which seemed to breathe like a huge whale and puff out fire and wind from its vast blowholes. Beneath, down a pretty steep declivity, ran streams of lava for eight or nine hundred feet, giving the mountain a height of about thirteen hundred or fourteen hundred feet but the base of the mountain was hidden in a perfect bower of rich verdure, amongst which I was able to distinguish the olive, the fig, and vines covered with their luscious purple bunches. I was forced to confess that there was nothing arctic here. When the eye passed beyond these green surroundings, it rested on a wide, blue expanse of sea or lake, which appeared to enclose this enchanting island within a compass of only a few leagues. Eastward lay a pretty little white seaport town or village, with a few houses scattered around it, and in the harbour of which a few vessels of peculiar rig were gently swayed by the softly swelling waves. Beyond it, groups of islets rose from the smooth blue waters, but in such numbers that they seemed to dot the sea like a shoal. To the west, distant coasts lined the dim horizon, on some rose-blue mountains of smooth, undulating forms, 
On a more distant coast arose a prodigious cone crowned on its summit with a snowy plume of white cloud. To the northward lay spread a vast sheet of water, sparkling and dancing under the hot, bright rays, the uniformity broken here and there by the topmast of a gallant ship appearing above the horizon, or a swelling sail moving slowly before the wind. This unforeseen spectacle was most charming to eyes long used to underground darkness. "'Where are we? Where are we?' I asked faintly. Hans closed his eyes with lazy indifference. What did it matter to him? My uncle looked round with dumb surprise. "'Well, whatever mountain this may be,' he said at last, "'it is very hot here. The explosions are still going on, and I don't think it would look well to have come out by an eruption and then to get our heads broken by bits of falling rock. Let us get down. Then we shall know better what we are about. Besides, I am starving and parching with thirst.' Decidedly, the professor was not given to contemplation. For my part, I could for another hour or two have forgotten my hunger and my fatigue to enjoy the lovely scene before me, but I had to follow my companions. The slope of the volcano was in many places of great steepness. We slid down screes of ashes, carefully avoiding the lava streams which glided sluggishly by us like fiery serpents. As we went, I chattered and asked all sorts of questions as to our whereabouts, for I was too much excited not to talk a great deal. "'We're in Asia,' I cried. "'On the coast of India, in the Malay Islands, or in Oceania.' We have passed through half the globe and come out nearly at the Antipodes. But the compass, said my uncle. Aye, the compass, I said, greatly puzzled. According to the compass, we have gone northward. Has it lied? Surely not. Could it lie? Unless, indeed, this is the North Pole. Oh, no, it is not the Pole, but... Well, here was something that baffled us completely. I could not tell what to say. But now we were coming into that delightful greenery, and I was suffering greatly from hunger and thirst. Happily, after two hours' walking, a charming country lay open before us, covered with olive trees, pomegranate trees, and delicious vines, all of which seemed to belong to anybody who pleased to claim them. Besides, in our state of destitution and famine, we were not likely to be particular. Oh, the inexpressible pleasure of pressing those cool, sweet fruits to our lips, and eating grapes by mouthfuls of the rich, full branches. Not far off, in the grass, under the delicious shade of the trees, I discovered a spring of fresh, cool water, in which we luxuriously bathed our faces, hands, and feet. While we were thus enjoying the sweets of repose, a child appeared out of a grove of olive trees. Ah, I cried, here is an inhabitant of this happy land. It was but a poor boy, miserably ill-clad, a sufferer from poverty, and our aspect seemed to alarm him a great deal. In fact, only half-clothed with ragged hair and beards, we were a suspicious-looking party, and if the people of the country knew anything about thieves, we were likely to frighten them. Just as the poor little wretch was going to take to his heels, Hans caught hold of him and brought him to us kicking and struggling. My uncle began to encourage him as well as he could, and said to him in good German, Was heißt diesen Berg, mein Klablein? Svage mir geschwind. What is this mountain called, my little friend? The child made no answer. Very well, said my uncle. I infer that we are not in Germany. He put the same question in English. We got no forwarder. I was a good deal puzzled. Is the child dumb? cried the professor, who, proud of his knowledge of many languages, now tried in French. Comment appelait-on cette montagne, mon enfant? Silence still. Now let us try Italian, said my uncle, and he said, Dove noi siamo? Yes, where are we? I impatiently repeated. But there was no answer still. Will you speak when you are told? exclaimed my uncle, shaking the urchin by the ears. Como si no mo questa isola? Stromboli, Stromboli, repeated the little herd boy, slipping out of Hans's hands and scudding into the plain across the olive trees. We were hardly thinking of that. Stromboli! What an effect this unexpected name produced upon my mind. We were in the midst of the Mediterranean Sea, on an island of the Aeolian archipelago, in the ancient Strongly, where Aeolus kept the winds and the storms chained up, to be let loose at his will. And those distant blue mountains in the east were the mountains of Calabria, and that threatening volcano far away in the south was the fierce Etna. Stromboli! Stromboli! I repeated. My uncle kept time to my exclamations with hands and feet, as well as with words. We seemed to be chanting in chorus. What a journey we had accomplished! How marvellous! Having entered by one volcano, we had issued out of another more than two thousand miles from Snaefell, and from that barren, far-away Iceland. The strange chances of our expedition had carried us into the heart of the fairest region in the world, 
We had exchanged the bleak regions of perpetual snow and of impenetrable barriers of ice for those of brightness and the rich hues of all glorious things. We had left over our heads the murky sky and cold fogs of the frigid zone to revel under the azure sky of Italy. After our delicious repast of fruits and cold clear water, we set off again to reach the port of Stromboli. It would not have been wise to tell how we came there. The superstitious Italians would have set us down for fire devils vomited out of hell, so we presented ourselves in the humble guise of shipwrecked mariners. It was not so glorious, but it was safer. On my way I could hear my uncle murmuring, But the compass, the compass, it pointed due north. How are we to explain that fact? My opinion is, I replied disdainfully, that it is best not to explain it. That is the easiest way to shelve the difficulty. Indeed, sir, the occupant of a professorial chair at the Johannium, unable to explain the reason of a cosmical phenomenon. Why, it would be simply disgraceful. And as he spoke, my uncle, half undressed, in rags, a perfect scarecrow with his leathern belt around him, settling his spectacles upon his nose and looking learned and imposing, was himself again, the terrible German professor of mineralogy. One hour after we had left the Grove of Olives, we arrived at the little seaport of San Vincenzo, where Hans claimed his thirteen weeks' wages, which was counted out to him with a hearty shaking of hands all round. At that moment, if he did not share our natural emotion, at least his countenance expanded in a manner very unusual with him, and while with the ends of his fingers he lightly pressed our hands, I believe he smiled. Chapter 45 All's Well That Ends Well such is the conclusion of a history which I cannot expect everybody to believe, for some people will believe nothing against the testimony of their own experience. However, I am indifferent to their incredulity, and they may believe as much or as little as they please. The Stromboliotes received us kindly as shipwrecked mariners. They gave us food and clothing. After waiting 48 hours on the 31st of August, a small craft took us to Messina, where a few days' rest completely removed the effect of our fatigues. On Friday, September the 4th, we embarked on the steamer Volturno, employed by the French Messagerie Imperiale, and in three days more we were at Marseille, having no care on our minds except the abominable, deceitful compass, which we had mislaid somewhere and could not now examine. But its inexplicable behaviour exercised my mind fearfully. On the 9th of September, in the evening, we arrived at Hamburg. I cannot describe to you the astonishment of Martha or the joy of Grauben. Now you are a hero, Axel said to me my blushing fiancée, my betrothed. You will not leave me again. I looked tenderly upon her, and she smiled through her tears. How can I describe the extraordinary sensation produced by the return of Professor Liedenbrock? Thanks to Martha's ineradicable tattling, the news that the professor had gone to discover a way to the centre of the earth had spread over the whole civilised world. People refused to believe it, and when they saw him they would not believe him any the more. Still, the appearance of hands and sundry pieces of intelligence derived from Iceland tended to shake the confidence of the unbelievers. Then my uncle became a great man, and I was now the nephew of a great man, which is not a privilege to be despised. Hamburg gave a grand fete in our honour. A public audience was given to the professor at the Johanneum, at which he told all about our expedition, with only one omission, the unexplained and inexplicable behaviour of our compass. On the same day, with much state, he deposited in the archives of the city the now famous document of Saknusem, and expressed his regret that circumstances over which he had no control had prevented him from following, to the very centre of the earth, the track of the learned Icelander. He was modest notwithstanding his glory, and he was all the more famous for his humility. So much honour could not but excite envy. There were those who envied him his fame, and as his theories, resting upon known facts, were in opposition to the systems of science upon the question of the central fire, he sustained with his pen and by his voice remarkable discussions with the learned of every country. For my part, I cannot agree with his theory of gradual cooling. In spite of what I have seen and felt, I believe, and always shall believe, in the central heat. But I admit that certain circumstances not yet sufficiently understood may tend to modify in places the action of natural phenomena. While these questions were being debated with great animation, my uncle met with a real sorrow. Our faithful hands, in spite of our entreaties, had left Hamburg. The man to whom we owed all our success, and our lives too, would not suffer us to reward him as we could have wished. He was seized with the mal de pays, a complaint for which we have not even a name in English. Farval, said he one day, and with that simple word he left us and sailed for Reykjavik, which he reached in safety. We were strongly attached to our brave Eiderdown hunter, though far away in the remotest north he will never be forgotten by those whose lives he protected, and certainly I shall not fail to endeavour to see him once more before I die. 
To conclude, I have to add that this journey into the interior of the earth created a wonderful sensation in the world. It was translated into all civilised languages. The leading newspapers extracted the most interesting passages, which were commented upon, picked to pieces, discussed, attacked and defended with equal enthusiasm and determination, both by believers and sceptics. Rare privilege. My uncle enjoyed during his lifetime the glory he had deservedly won, and he may even boast the distinguished honour of an offer from Mr Barnum to exhibit him on the most advantageous terms in all the principal cities in the United States. But there was one dead fly amidst all this glory and honour. One fact, one incident of the journey remained a mystery. Now, to a man eminent for his learning, an unexplained phenomenon is an unbearable hardship. Well, it was yet reserved for my uncle to be completely happy. One day, while arranging a collection of minerals in his cabinet, I noticed in a corner this unhappy compass, which we had long lost sight of. I opened it and began to watch it. It had been in that corner for six months, little mindful of the trouble it was giving. Suddenly, to my intense astonishment, I noticed a strange fact, and I uttered a cry of surprise. "'What is the matter?' my uncle asked. "'That compass.' "'Well?' "'See, its poles are reversed.' "'Reversed?' "'Yes, they point the wrong way.' My uncle looked. He compared, and the house shook with his triumphant leap of exultation. A light broke in upon his spirit and mine. "'See there,' he cried as soon as he was able to speak. After our arrival at Cape Sacknesem, the north pole of the needle of this confounded compass began to point south instead of north. Evidently. Here, then, is the explanation of our mistake. But what phenomenon could have caused this reversal of the poles? The reason is evident, uncle. Tell me, then, Axel. During the electric storm on the Liedenbrock Sea, that ball of fire which magnetised all the iron on board reversed the poles of our magnet. Ha! 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 shouted the professor with a loud laugh. So it was just an electric joke. From that day forth, the professor was the most glorious of savants, and I was the happiest of men, for my pretty Villandaise, resigning her place as ward, took her position in the old house on the Königstrasse, in the double capacity of niece to my uncle, and wife to a certain happy youth. What is the need of adding that the illustrious Otto Liedenbrock, corresponding member of all the scientific, geographical and mineralogical societies of all the civilised world, was now her uncle, and mine? This has been a recording of Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne, a public domain book. This book was read by Tom Wilkinson and is a production of Tinker Tailor Soldier Sponge Productions. You can find other audiobooks released periodically as podcast episodes at audio-folio.com. You can find other Tinker Tailor Soldier Sponge podcasts at tinkertailorsoldiersponge.com. And thank you for listening.